Good morning. Good afternoon. A pair of tortoise shell glasses was left at the table. Anybody? Okay. Red, red, red is our last talk, sadly. Um, red is really more than a color. It's completely embedded in our language. You see red, you put out the red carpet, you hope to meet a scarlet woman or not, depending on whether you're the wife. And uh, um, red, red is, you're, you're red in tooth and claw, you see red. Red is so much embedded in, the, in, in our language. And so today is a bit of a challenge, and I felt that we would try and talk about it in terms of its sacred and secular meaning. So we're going to start with its connection to the divine, and then we will move on to the connection with political power, the sacred, um, secular, right? Now, it's really a very bipolar, bipolar, a bipolar color, because you have qualities of warm, it's loving, it's exciting, it's passionate, it's very positive, it's also sacrificial, but then it's also violent, angry, and dangerous. It's a red light that you stop at, it's a warning light, but it's also something that literally speeds up your heart. So red has got this very bipolar character, and I think the talk today hopefully is going to show that. We're going to go way back now to ancient Egypt, and we're going to see how red um, came into action in their iconography. And you're looking at a very nice fresco, very, very early wall painting, and you see the cosmic tree. Cosmic tree, the axis mundi, axis of the world. And you see the elixir of everlasting life being poured out in four red streams from the cosmic tree which bears red fruit. I know you're all rushing forward to what's going to happen in about 10 minutes, but give me, just give me time to get there. So you see, here are the four. Now, oopsie, sorry, that went wrong. Not, this is another new toy that I've been given here. Um, you see here, this is really, you see one, two, three, four. Can you all see it, right? You see the red fruit and the tree and being, being captured in a sort of cup or a chalice. And this is the elixir of everlasting life, something that was very important in, Egypt, in ancient Egypt. And it's red, and it's coming out in the four streams. So when we go on staying now in the east, we find that red is very strongly associated with the divine. And we see it here as the color of Ganesha, who is the elephant god who's worshiped absolutely everywhere in all aspects of Hinduism. And you see him here, he always stands on a rather unfortunate blue rat, gets squashed. <laughs> but Ganesha is the god you need. He's the god of choice because he sees off all obstacles. That's why he multitasks with all these different weapons and things at his disposal. The main thing is he's stained with this very, very strong red dye, 
And this is, the, this is another thing I'm talking about, is where the dyes came from, how they make the dyes. Another one, a Mongolian one, you see him again in red, standing on the poor, sad little blue mouse there. And I think it's extraordinary that somehow the ancient mystics in ancient, in, in ancient India knew somehow that red had the slowest frequency and ultramarine the fastest. So red is then the color of the base chakra at the base of the spine. And it's a color of self-awareness, of courage, of stability. Obviously, it's the base of your spine. And security. How did they know that red had the slowest frequency and that the ultramarine that I talked about yesterday had the very fastest frequency and was the color of the highest chakra, the third eye, after which white light when all the waves and go together, all the frequencies. I think that's fascinating that somehow they understood that. So red is therefore very important for all those reasons. When you come to China, red is not just a propitious color. As we know from Chinese New Year, that's a superficial way of looking at it. But it's much deeper than that. And I thought there might be, I thought there might be a link between dragons and red. I know we see red dragons all the time, but is there a, some kind of mythic link? And in the researching dragons, I found that dragons uh, possibly came from the idea of the, what they call the upward spiraling sun. The sun rises in the morning, and sort of they saw it as spiraling up into the sky. And you see that these dragons here are vertical. They, they give me something new here, which can't um, I don't know why I couldn't have done that before. Anyway. Um, so you see that he's got... Five claws, and those imperial dragons have five claws. If they're five claws, five talons, it's an imperial dragon. So these imperial dragons on some emperor's robe are going vertically, not horizontally, and may symbolize the rising sun, and may be linked, therefore, to the worship of the sun. And, of course, the color red. This is a Chinese lacquer box. And you can see the swastikas up there from the Hindu word swasti, meaning to go well. The swastika was a good sign for very many centuries. When we move on to Rome, we found that the Romans painted the walls of their religious buildings red and then glazed them in order to reflect the light. But there's a little bit more to it than that. They, they believed that, that red, again, was a divine color to somehow associate with divinity. And they colored the face of their god, the Olympian god, with red paint. Not the Olympian god, the capital line um, Jupiter. He was covered with red paint. And maybe you'd like to turn your phones off right now. How about that? Sorry, I should have reminded you. So in, in Rome, the face of um, Capitoline Jupiter was painted red. And for this reason, if you were a great general and you had immensely, been immensely successful and you were given a pomp, which is a procession, triumph through Rome, you know, you'd go in your chariot with all the armor clinking and the horses, the outriders and the spears and the flashing helmets and, and everything else, and you'd have all the slaves that you'd captured coming along behind with the slave king, which would have his, the back of his neck trodden on by the emperor. Um, and, and, and you, let's say Tiberius or wherever you were, Germanicus, in the chariot with your face painted red and wearing purple and gold as the emperor would. But because of the Romans being who they were, they, you had a little man in the chariot at your feet saying, you are not a god, you are not a god, you are not a god, <laughs> just in case anybody got too big for their boots. But the, but the Romans had this, um, this great respect for control and you know, what it meant to be a man and everything else. And they were particularly worried about relaxing their um, standards. They were very, very unhappy about strong colors coming in from the east. And Pliny himself, he wrote, perhaps I've got it here, Pliny, yes. And now India contributes the ooze of her rivers and the blood of dragons and of elephants, clearly suggesting that the new red colors 
they were coming in, were bringing with them a very nasty whiff of Oriental decadence. And in the um, Republic of Rome, Republican Rome, there was always this fear that if you didn't have a particularly stiff upper lip, the next thing would be fishnet tights for men. So uh, they had a very austere sense of color, and they got from the Greeks a color spectrum, which had no color in it at all. It was indeed a spectrum of light and dark, from dark to light, not, from, not, the, not the Newtonian spectrum at all. So this is Rome and the red color coming in. And this is actually a house in Pompeii showing how the red might have been used. But red was also associated with the divine and the sun in one of the most successful cults that came to Rome, which was Mithraism. Now, Mithraism came from the ancient Near East. It was Zoroastrian. And Mithras is a young uh, savior god. He's a god of light, of resurrection, of sacrifice and of personal liberation. And there you see him sacrificing the bull, the bull representing his, the creator God, his father, while he is the son, and he was said to be of one substance with the father. And as he sacrifices the bull, you see the serpent drinking the blood, and that is the serpent drinking the blood. The serpent is not a bad thing in the Greek and Roman world. The serpent is a symbol of of everlasting life, of eternal life, because the symbol, because the serpent sheds its skin. Um, Mithraism was immensely successful. There were about 200 Mithraea in Rome at the time that Christianity was, uh, was, was, was being born. And of course, Christianity was not called Christianity. It was simply called the Way. Followers of the Way were under a lot of pressure from Mithraism. And Mithras, as you see, has seven stars on his robe here. I wish they'd just give me the one I had yesterday. OK, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which was the sacred number of the god Apollo, who is also a sun god. Um, you might just notice, by the way, that Mithras has a floppy hat, which flops over the front and has these flaps, which is a Phrygian cap, as we saw in our Greek talks. So. A Mithras then, a god of personal liberation, very much followed by the Roman army. The, the biggest mistake they made was not to allow women in, because it was women that pushed the early church forward. The Christian church was developed very strongly by women, often Roman patrician women, who set up house churches in their houses. Um, so just to see, to show you that, that he is a sun god, you can see this. Deo Sol Invictus image here. Deo Sol, sun god, uh, you know, unconquerable. An image like that on the um, Barberini Mithraeum. Now, when we go on to red itself, there's Tyrrhenian purple. We always call it Tyrrhenian purple. It was actually the color of clotted blood. It was more purple than red. And this was the absolute badge of status long before the Romans uh, took over from the Greeks. Alexander the Great had a beautiful robe, dyed in purple, which was still purple 200 years after his death. And the purple dye came from this shell called the muric shell, right here. And it, it sort of secreted with a kind of glandular excretion, which was completely clear. But as soon as it hit the air, oxidized, it became red. And you would have to collect about 12,000 of these shells in order to dye, uh, in order to get 1.4 grams of dye, 1.4 grams from 12,000 shells, to dye just the tiniest strip for a senator. As you can see, Theodora here, the Empress Theodora, who I understand was a goer in no uncertain terms, here she is in a full purple robe. It was so prestigious, so expensive, and so special that the punishment for make, trying to make it or wear it, if you were not entitled, was quite simply death. So it was a capital offense. So that is the trend in purple, which of course, me, all the things like being born into the purple, uh, it all comes from the status of this one color, which really was clotted, the color of clotted blood. So how did they find these reds? Well, one, of, one red was cochineal, and it comes from these insects here, which were collected off um, spiky uh, cactus plants 
Here you see them being collected in Chile, being brushed off with the tail of an animal, and also from the Rubia tinctorum um, plant. So that's the plant down here. And this plant here was brought to Europe by the Crusades, <coughs> Crusaders. So never say they didn't do anything good. They bought this wonderful Rubia tinctorum. And in the Middle Ages, all of um, many places in, in France and Italy were growing this root. But being the Middle Ages, everything was done according to the Christian calendar. And so the harvesting of the Rubia tinctorum had to happen on the feast day of St. John. And if by any chance the weather changed and the crop went wrong, well, the price went through the roof, as you can imagine. So matter this wonderful red. Now we're going to the Middle Ages, and we now can imagine we've got this tradition already set, and we're in a medieval convent, the convent of San Marco in Florence. It's still there. I really love you to go. And in the convent of San Marco, in all those doors, there were monks, including Fra Angelico. And at the end of the corridor, there was a scriptorium where the monks would spend all their time copying out the Bible by hand. Um, eventually, Savonarola, the vicious, I say vicious, um, monk who was from Ferrara, Savonarola, became the, the, the master of this convent and eventually the master of Florence for about six years before the city elders burnt him at the stake. Well, he was so anti everything that's truly Christian. However, there we go. So when we go into the scriptorium, we see that the red was used for the words of Christ in the Bible. It was the highest color they had. And also for um, special holidays in the Christian calendar. And that's just one book. The books were so very sacred, so very precious, that they were chained to the wooden uh, desks in the libraries of the abbeys. I mean, think from, you know, we live in a world where we throw the word away. We sort of vaguely, I mean, I understand that, that um, concentration is now at something like 3.5 seconds or something, something ridiculous. People simply don't value the word. On the other hand, if something isn't written down, we don't trust it. So we're completely between the devil and the deep blue sea. Um, I, I mean, I, as I get older, I said yesterday, I'm not all that sure that literacy is so wonderful because it absolutely disempowers memory and it also disempowers, um, what was the other thing? Imagination. Because when you think in your head, they're much more real than when you see it described in text. Well, at this point, every single word that was written was written by human hand and valued immensely. And if you wanted to read, read something, you had to ask your abbot, could I go to the, the, the Abbey of Conk? It'll take me three months to get there, but I promise I'll come back. And you'd set off on your donkey, and then you'd be in another abbey. And eventually, if the abbot liked you, you'd be allowed to see the texts under supervision. Some of the texts had poison on the pages so that you would die if you. I mean, th these, the, the word was immensely bad. Right. And red was part of that. So the red appearing in the, in the written word is very important. And these are some of the colors they had. So you've got the red, you've got the, um, I don't know why it does that when I turn around, but you've got the ultramarine blue, uh, lead white, lead white, um, orpiment, and verdigris, and lamp black, scraped off the lamps as they smoked, and, and the different colors, some of the earth colors, and the ochres, and the kermes, the, the scarlet. So let's see these colors in action. Let's forget about everything except the year 1107. There is Beatus of Libana in northern Spain. He believes passionately in the pilgrimage to Santiago. He believes passionately that St. James was in Spain. And this is a page from what's called the Silas Apocalypse of Beatus of Libana. Um, Silos is a wonderful monastery just off the pilgrim route near Borgos. And when you see, and they still chant for hours every day. It's wonderful. You can go. Um, I chose this particular page because it helps me to say a few things about color. First of all, the words of the gospel say, thy word shall be a lamp unto my feet. Now in the medieval world, people believed that real light shone from the gospel. And so the gospel would be held up like that. 
And in many churches even today, after the reading, the gospel is held up. Because real light poured from the word. As you can see here, the Christ figure is holding up the gospel, and he is swathed in seven clouds. He's swayed in the seven clouds here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, of course, which would, would tell you the seven is the sacred number of the Holy Spirit of God. It goes right back to Apollo. It's sacred to Apollo as well. Um, and so there are the seven. And b b beneath him, all the pilgrims look up, and the light of the gospel floods down on their faces. And these ones are getting more of the light, obviously. The yellow is highly, highly unusual at such an early a stage. It's called Flavus. Anyway, and the sky is not blue, but red, because here in this image, the whole sky is full of the love of God. So the red then symbolizes the, um, the, the, the love of God that flows from the throne of God, from the center of the cosmos, out to everywhere. So as we go on now, let's see. Um, that wonderful scarlet that you saw came from this little insect called kermits, which is an Arabic word, and that insect could be crushed and it would produce a scarlet which is called kermit. And so you see it very, very often in medieval painting. But much more than that, it was again a color of enormous status. And it was only in the 13th century that cardinals were allowed to wear red. If we go here, you'll see there is a cardinal wearing kermes, and it was in 1242, that's the middle of the 13th century, when Pope Innocent IV decides to allow cardinals to wear red, and they have worn red to this very day. Not only cardinals, but aristocrats could wear red, um, dukes and you know, people of the law wore red. It was very much a color associated with status. So in the background, you can see that this cardinal would like you to think about Saint Jerome. You can see Saint Jerome in the back here. And Saint Jerome, who is beating his breast with a stone, and he has his cardinal's hat lying in front of him, even though he's in the desert, supposedly. Jerome is the one who translated the, the Bible into Latin, the whole Bible from Hebrew and Greek, into Latin, and it's called the Vulgate. So he's immensely important, of course. Um, little aids to meditation, for example, the hourglass to remind you about how short your life is in the background. Um, it's very sad to have to tell you that Ambrosio Lorenzetti, one of the great, great um, Sienese painters from, from, from Italy, died in the Black Death. And he also worked in Avignon, because at that time, Avignon was the center of the papal court. They were all in the palace at Avignon. I think this is the most amazing hieratic um, maestra. It shows the Virgin in black, or very dark blue, almost black. And she's on a throne and surrounded by angels. <coughs> and there are three steps to her, to her throne, three steps. Can I just ask, is everybody happy now? Have we settled in a bit? I, yeah, I felt a bit agitated with all the things happening, but there we are. So you see the three stages. One, Three steps, one, two, three, yeah. And um, the steps are there, well, partly because she's on a throne, but it's also because it tells you of the three characteristics that you need to have if you, need to, if you would like to approach the Virgin Mary, but it also tells us of her own character. And it tells us that the three greatest qualities that you would need would be faith, Fides, in Latin here, fides, fides, hope, spes, there, and caritas, love. Faith, hope, and love, or faith, hope, and charity. And they are symbolized by white for faith, green for hope, and red for charity. Um, green is also was the color of the unity of the Godhead. Of course, you see green when you go out into nature, so it's not surprising that green became associated with the unity of the Godhead and the unity of the Trinity. Um, and as a little warning, and to break up the black, you have in the very middle the angel here holding up the fruit, to, or the forbidden fruit, to remind you of the, of the fall, and also to remind you that, 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 that the Virgin Mary 
is the, called the Second Eve. So that is a little bit about how read, but caritas is one of the four aspects of love. It is the, the divine love, the pure love. It's not the Beatles type of love or anything like that. It's the pure, pure love. It's not eros or philos, it's agape, caritas. Now, another very early altarpiece, this is from Florence. It's the large, largest altarpiece that was made in the 14th century in France. It was made in 1370 took about 12 years to get paid. I'm not even sure he was paid. And was made in a medieval workshop that was the workshop of Jacopo di Cione. And you see the Virgin and Christ um, on, a, on, a, on a wide double throne. Um, behind, she has a cloth of honor behind her. It's called a cloth of honor. And Christ is crowning her queen of heaven. So the coronation of the Virgin is a very popular subject in the Middle Ages, but it is quite um, it's not scriptural, it's simply not, not in scripture. It was all part of the rise of Mary in the Middle Ages. And you see that she is almost co-redeemer. She's the same sa scale, she wears the same clothes, she has the same hair, same halo, and she's on the same throne. This is an absolutely enormous altarpiece, um, but I put it in to show you the angels behind the throne. So on both sides you've got two red angels, with fire on their heads. And it, can you see the flames? I find when I turn, I lose the mic, so I'm going to try and you see the flames there, right? So it's quite a good slide. The flames are there for the presence of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, and the angels are red. They are the highest of the nine choirs of angels. They are the seraphs, and yesterday I talked about the cherubs. So the seraphim are the highest choir of angels, and they're red because they stand behind the throne of God. And they only have one job. They only have one job. They simply sing Sanctus, 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 Sanctus for all eternity in any language you like. And that's, the, that's all they do. They praise. Um, they have nothing whatsoever to do with mortals, neither do cherubims or thrones. They are there purely to praise. And why are they red? Because they are the closest, and the f red from the throne reflects off them. So we see another seraph here on a medieval triptych by the Zylan, on the Zylan altarpiece by Robert Campen. And I showed you the blue angel yesterday. So here is the seraph seen against a background of the true vine. You can see the true vine winding around, which as I told you, also symbolized the caring Christian church in the early years and the, the grapes of the Eucharist. So, the point is that this is a scene of the entombment. So it's right after the Last Supper. And you, when you look at this image of this um, seraph, he holds up a crown of thorns. But the crown of thorns also looks like a sun. And it also looks like a victory wreath. And somehow the sun, the victory wreath, the red, which is also a color of suffering, and the wings, the whole thing comes together and seems to, uh, in some ancient way, uh, cast back to the great victories of the ancient world. But the, sun is the, the crown of thorns is particularly like a sun in this one image. And you see the two angels together there, the seraph and the cherub, and you will see that, the, that this scene shows us Christ being entombed. Now, it's extraordinary. Here is Robert Campen painting in 14, 20. We didn't know who painted this for years until quite recently. And he shows us that the, this person who is mortal, do notice that there are no halos anywhere. This is Flemish art, so there are no halos. No halos. And this person who is clearly mortal is being lowered into a sarcophagus, a human mortal figure. And he is wrapped in his prayer shawl because all Jewish men are buried in their prayer shawls. He also has black hair and a dark beard, and there are Hebrew letters here on the hat of Nicodemus. In 1420, that's quite remarkable, because this is um, a triptych. And what it is trying to say to you is, as you meditate, do remember that Christ was Jewish. And this was at a height of anti-Semitism in Europe. I'm trying to say something about the Netherlands has always had this tendency to open-mindedness. Very interesting. Just look at the composition. There's a tremendous downward 
um, V here, tremendous V, another V plunging down, and there's a V here, and above all the V of the frame, as if an axe was taken and just bang. And those downward lines take you down into the tomb with Christ. You are pulled down by the composition. As you're pulled down, you see Mary Magdalene looks into the void, the blackness. Now, in the Middle Ages, the void was terrifying because it was a time of demons and angels, and any void would be full of dark spirits. She looks into the void, and she faces the reality of death as she touches the foot, which is cold. You know, that's a terrible moment. Um, so, and there's Veronica, you can see the whole thing. But as he goes down into the tomb in white, look at this, he rises out of the tomb wearing red. Okay, one more chance to turn off your phones, otherwise, I don't know. Can we all turn off your phones? Thanks. Okay, so he, step, he steps out of the tomb in red. Um, let's go back now to 1420 and we look at this figure we see a number of things strike us as interesting the figure is very rigid the leg is very straight that alludes to the, the rightness the justice is straight it goes way back to the archaic Greek period in our Greek, in archaic Greek period um, justice was always um, personified as straight we still say he's a straight bloke, or he's bent, he's crooked, don't we? We say he's a crook, or he's bent. Well, interestingly enough, the soldiers at the foot of the sarcophagus were always shown bent and crooked, and like that. And here is Christ stepping out very straight, and he raises up his right hand in the Trinitarian blessing and looks down. He invites you by his look to not look at him, but to look at these soldiers, particularly this one, that seems to be blinded as he looks up his eyes. He doesn't, and Christ does the unthinkable, unthinkable. The first thing he does is to bless and forgive the people who put him there. And this is a meditation on forgiveness. And you see behind him the angel in green telling us again about the hope that will come from all of this. So when you look at these paintings, there's so much more to them. The red here will, be, will stand obviously for the sin of the world, um, the, the, the huge mantle of sin that, that fell on Christ during that time, but also for the love that redeems a sin, because we know that it's the color of God's love. You also see it as a color of um, kingship and authority. So it's a very, very important cluster of meanings that come together in this painting. Now, in, uh, in, the, in the monastery I've just been showing you, every cell has a painting for meditation, all by, by Fra Angelico. And this is the crucifixion. And when I looked at that, I thought I was seeing things. I wasn't very certain about what was going on. First of all, obviously, the black background, which, which would have come from lamp black from the kitchens in the monastery. And that black would very clearly allude to the three hours of darkness at the time of crucifixion, when there was a solar eclipse and the light went out at noon. Now, if I ever get around to doing my, my talk about the stars, the fact is there was a solar eclipse, which I checked by looking at the histories of the Olympic Games. Um, a, Greek, a Greek historian writing about the Olympiads, the 212th Olympiad fell at the same time as the crucifixion, and there was the deepest, the deepest um, eclipse that anybody had ever seen. So in this, in this thing, all you see the INRI, standing for Jesus Nazarenus Rex Eudorum, and you see here at the bottom four trickles of blood. Now that is the bit that bothered me. I can remember sitting there thinking, four is not a sacred number, this is not working for me, I know there's something wrong, what's going on? But I go closer, yes, certainly, definitely four. And by thinking it through and putting it together with various other studies and research, I realized that it's alluded to Genesis. And like everything, as I tried to tell you yesterday, the New Testament and the Old Testament are inextricably woven together, and it's what's called typology. But this particular bit of symbolism alludes directly to Genesis. And it, it alludes to, I'll read you from Genesis, streams came up from the earth and watered the whole garden. 
um, Genesis 2.10, a river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there, it was separated into four headwaters. So I wasn't very surprised when I found on this early sarcophagus that the blood running from Golgotha is also portrayed as water in the early church. This shows us, a, this is the Mound of Golgotha here, and we see that Christ is portrayed, personified as a lamb, the Agnes Dei. We are too early to have the cross, so we have the Cairo up here. There's a Cairo, which is the Chi, and the, the thing that looks like a P is an R in Greek, from Christ, and that was the sign that came to Constantine in a vision, in a dream. So this wonderful sarcophagus from the third century, or very, very early fourth, shows us Christ as the Lamb of God on Golgotha, and the four streams are the streams of water that flowed from Eden and brought life to the world. And they later on become, in a more, in a more, in a more um, liter literary sort of world, they become the streams of blood from the cross. Of course, eventually, the church said, we can't go on do with this. Christ has to be portrayed as a man, and eventually he was, because people thought his mortality was being denied. Um, the Cairo is a wonderful sign. I wish that the church had kept it. We also have the palm trees, symbols of victory on either side there. Um, you see in this another sarcophagus, Christ is here as a man now, standing on Golgotha, and you see water, not blood, running from them. He's handing the law to St. Peter. It's called the Traditio Legis, as he gives the law to Peter, and it is Peter that carries the cross, and Peter that has the sheep. You see, you couldn't portray the cross when people were being crucified every day outside Rome, could you? Well, you couldn't. You really couldn't. And it was only after Constantine, after Constantine abolished the crucifixion in 312 AD that the cross began, becomes a symbol. Okay? Now, we are going whizzing forward because um, I left you, if you can just remember the campan, the rising out of the tomb is red. red. Christ is very often in red in post resurrection paintings. And this is a, this is a um, counter-reformation painting by Anibale Karachi from 601 um, AD. And you see it was painted for one of the cardinals, Cardinal Maria del Monte, who was the patron of Caravaggio. And weirdly, because Caravaggio and, and of course, um, and Karachi were great enemies. But here you see him. Now, this is called Domine Quo Vardis, this painting. And it's, it's very interesting. What's happening is it alludes to the time when the Jews and Christians were being persecuted by Nero and blamed for the great fire of London. And they were fleeing Rome. A lot of the Christians were Greek slaves. So you were not only losing Christians, you were actually losing your slaves. Um, and they were fleeing Rome, and they were being crucified in job lots down the Appian Way. And Peter was human, as we know from the Gospel, and he was a bit flaky. So he was also fleeing down the Appian Way. What happens as he flees down the Appian Way? He has a vision of Christ coming towards him, and he's so shocked. He says, Domine, quo vadis? Lord, where are you going? And Jesus says, and Jesus doesn't say, actually, Peter, where are you going? I did say, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. He doesn't say that. He just answers. He says, I'm going back to Rome to be crucified again. Well, phew, that worked. And here we have Peter looking not at Christ's face, looking askance because he can't look at the face. And he's looking at the wound because he's confronting Christ's immortality and the possibility of his own. And we see it's a great painting of contrast that the Christ figure is idealized, of course, strides forward, um, carrying the cross, which breaks into our space because it's the beginning of the Baroque. While Peter would like to get out of the painting, his heel jammed against the frame in, in a crouching negative position. He's also on the distaff side of the painting. And, um, and he wears the keys, just in case you're not sure that he's Peter. He also has a square beard, which is what he has in the catechism. So, Domine Quo Vadis, where the red is shown on the, on the resurrected Christ. 
And we see that, um, by the way, there's, I'm terribly sorry, I perhaps shouldn't say this, but this is an apocryphal story, so you needn't be too upset about it. Um, and they say that he was crucified upside down. That's entirely apocryphal because Peter was never in Rome at all, sadly. There's no historical evidence. But don't let's go there. It's probably upset people. It doesn't matter. By this day, it doesn't really matter. Peter is there. Peter is Rome. So we go on to another Counter-Reformation painting by Michelangelo da Caravaggio, the Supper at Emmaus. It's not the Last Supper. It's a Supper at Emmaus, also in the same year. And we have this painting by Caravaggio, who was very much the bad boy of everything. And he paints this painting. It's an extraordinarily compelling painting, primarily because you're not challenged to look at the face of Christ. Christ looks down at a basket that's about to fall off a table. Now, as you're running through the National Gallery, you think, um, oh, I'll just, uh, I'll just push it back up. I'll just you know, push it down like that. But that while you're doing that, of course, you arrive at the table. The basket really is a vanitas. A vanitas is the world. It, it's about the world. It's about fruit rots, our lives pass. It's about the reality of being in the world. And it's falling into our laps because that's it for everybody. So you have this marvelous image of Christ looking down at the basket like that and raising his hand over the bread, possibly saying, um, I am the bread of life. But as you look at the basket, you see the symbolism of all sorts of things. You see the grapes for the Eucharist. You see the rotten apple for the fall, the leaf of the, the vine, the true vine. And you see a pomegranate, which is a symbol of the passion. But most of all, if you're all on your toes, which you'd have to be if you were in the National Gallery with me, you would see in the shadow, what's that? Well done. Well done. And it's the fish ichthys because it's the earliest sign of the early Christians. It is a secret sign that kept them alive. And the catacombs had only recently been re rediscovered and only recently. And I think Caravaggio, being a bit of a hot blood, probably went down into the catacombs with an oil lamp and saw them. Uh, this is just an extraordinary painting. I mean, I could talk at least for an hour. There is so much in this painting. As you come closer, you have the extraordinary dynamic of the gestures of the hands. You have the gesture of the calling. You have the gesture, you have the sign of the commitment, the pilgrimage, taking the cockle, becoming a follower. You have the blessing, and you have the journeying, the way, the leaving. And all of that in the in this dynamics of the hand. As you go back, you see you're actually in orbit around the sun in this elliptical orb because the arms are coming out right out to you and you're pulled back into the painting. Now, the face is also extraordinary because he takes on the character of the Hellenistic savior gods with the long wavy hair and the, the attitude of the head and so on. In comparison to the disciples who have followed him from, who've been with him up to Emmaus, and the wonderful shell that symbolizes the pilgrimage, which was going very strongly at that time, but obviously not at the time of the Supper of Emmaus. He wears the red and white, as you see, the red for all the sin of the world, but also the love that redeems it, and the white for the presence of the Holy Spirit and for faith. Um, now, we're right at the, in the beginning of the 17th century. We have the rise of humanism. We haven't got into the Enlightenment, but we're getting there. And the, with the Enlightenment, we're going to bring a great interest in alchemy. So the painting you're looking at is probably a work of alchemy. It was commissioned by Pietro Aretino, who was a, 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 um, a Renaissance journalist, and he was a very well-known alchemist. Parmigianino was a very, very big alchemist. He died because he went completely crazy because of it. And here you see the Christ child holding up a red pink rose, to proclaim himself the Red King. The red is the top um, color of alchemy. I wasn't sure that you wanted to do too much, and I just took out two contemporary paintings about alchemy, because I thought you wouldn't want to do them. But uh, so you see this, and the coral, of course, also, um, that coral representing the blood of Christ. So alchemy is a very, very big thing, and you find Christ being, um, being fused with this idea of an alchemical great king. 
Now, I'm not going to say that's about the next picture I'm showing you. I'm just warning you that there's some fluidity going on in the ideas of this period. I'm going to show you one of the greatest paintings of the resurrection, which is this one, which shows Christ as the son of righteousness, rising from the philosopher's stone, lifting as he rises from the tomb, and the soldiers fall in disarray. And here, you, it's quite definitely a celestial vision. And you see that here. So this is the resurrection panel by uh, Matthias Grunewald, which is in Colmar. And you can see the date, the early 16th century. Incidentally, also painted at a time of plague. When you see this painting, I think the words of Isaiah come to mind, as they always do when I think about cosmic things. Isaiah says, who is this? coming from Edom with his garments stained crimson. Who is this, robed in splendor, striding forward in the greatness of his strength? It is I, speaking in righteousness, mighty to save. Come closer and you see this extraordinary image that inspired people during a time of plague. So we go on to the distaff side of red and you can see that the cosmic tree is there again it is in the center of the Garden of Eden, and it bears red fruit. And the red fruit will provide the apple that, that, that Eve will give to Adam. And you see the snake, the serpent coming down the tree there, and all around the animals that are in paradise. And down below, two patches of dry ground and water, one for baptism and the other for the suffering of man, because um, man is going to go and have to work now forever. I just, before I leave this painting, I want to just point out one clever bit of iconography. The fact is, we, you know about the Agnes Day now, so there is the Agnes Day, and you have the Agnes Day alone, there's no other lamb, and the figure of Adam, and they are both captured in the tines of the stag's antlers, like that, okay? Now, if you just let your mind go and think laterally, what do the, what do the stag's antlers make you think of? Very good, well done, exactly. So the point is, what, what Lucas Cranach is doing is saying it was through that, the crown of thorns, that the, that the sin of Adam is righted, put right again. So, I mean, all of the paintings I'm showing you have got far more than just those ideas, but they're, they're impressive. So here is Eve, and she is the first woman, and she is sinful, and she's expelled. And then we have Mary Magdalene taking on all of that, as Mary Magdalene takes on the red of, of the sinful woman, becomes a, the absolute sinful woman, and she lets her hair down in public, which is unheard of. And here you see her turning around and seeing the gardener. This is, the, this is by Orcania. He used to be called the master of the lame and crucifixion. And it's about the same time as that big altarpiece I showed you. So Mary Magdalene wears scarlet. Uh, as I, I mentioned in my radio interview, that um, she, she was really only, um, she only became a prostitute 600 years after her death when one of the popes, <laughs> well, I never tell you anything that isn't true, when she was sort of rebranded because it, it, was, it was just the polarity of Mary and the two Marys. But it's quite a wonderful story because Mary goes down to, the, down to the Garden of Gethsemane early in the morning and John's story begins with the words, it was still dark. It was still dark. And she goes down and it was still dark. And she looks in and it's empty. It's empty, it's dark. And she swings around and she sees the gardener and the gardener says one word, Mary. So this is this marvelous moment of recognition. And the composition links up very strongly with the eye contact. It is the eye contact that's electricity. And then in the background, the three trees, which would make you think about perhaps the Trinity or indeed Calvary. I think the third tree was painted afterwards because you can see the gold through the trunk. So possibly added on by some astute abbot saying, why don't we just make that three? Mary Magdalene there with long loose hair which of course was absolutely not the right thing to do. So Mary Magdalene always in red. Um, in these wonderful images of the Mary Magdalene, she wears the red and she is the image of repentance and she has the jar. I think you can see she's got her hand on the jar. Can you see that? 
And this is a lovely painting, also Noli Me Tangere, which means do not touch me, painted by Titian. Uh, you see the flock, the, sh the Christian flock in the background there. And I can't talk about it too much, but I just wanted to mention that uh, Mary Magdalene has this jar of ointment, supposedly. And I, I got up in the middle of the night and had to make tea when I realized quite suddenly that she took on all the characteristics of Pandora. Pandora, yes. Pandora, in Hesiod's Pandora, has a jar. The jar has a lid. The lid comes off, and all the evils of the world pour out. And the evils of the world are all our human beings. That's what it is. It's the human race. And under the lid clings Elpis. That's the Greek word for hope. I suddenly saw that, that Mary Magdalene is also pouring out the evil of the world. Now, let's get on to more of the distal side of red. The rock be Venus in the National Gallery is very famous as a luxurious uh, image of a reclining nude. And the color here is uh, alizarin crimson, which is a different kind of red altogether from the Kermes. And this painting has inspired great hatred, particularly among women who are probably not quite as beautiful as her. And in the early 20th century, a woman came into the National Gallery with a knife and slashed her like that. Um, she was a suffragette. And moving on to the end of the, yes, in the 19th century, of course, Manet's famous Olympia has a red fly in her hair and sits on a red cushion. And she's contrast to the purity of her maid who wears white and carries flowers and has a lovely innocent face and is contrasted strongly with the in-your-face attitude of Olympia who looks straight at you. And remember, you're all men. It's assumed that the viewing art public is male and doesn't care because um, she just looks straight at you. This painting was very deeply shocking, and I, can't, I haven't got time to go into it right now, but it's very, very interesting. And again, the red associated with that sexuality. Again, in Gauguin, by now we're using artificial alizarin, crimson, in enormous quantities made in, in, in Germany, and this is called the loss of virginity. Um, I think something that... Gauguin probably knew quite a lot about. <laughs> and you see this child, it looks as if she's going to be laid into a grave, which is very spiky, and the funeral procession coming down the hill. So red again, you know, deflowering, uh, blood, um, passion, sexuality, and possibly death. Now, the, I'm now moving just for the last... 10 minutes or so, up to the political power of red. Even from the Renaissance, red was associated with political power. And you see the Duke of Urbino wearing red, um, very, very strong Kermish red. By the way, he had his nose cut out so he could see better during war. It's not a birth defect. And then you have, um, in Florence, very many boys wearing red caps. And they're painted by Botticelli. And they could denote political freedom or even republicanism. And I'm saying to my students endlessly, time on time and time again, Florence was a republic. It was free of the Vatican. That's why the Renaissance grew so tremendously strongly in Florence. And it was very useful to the Vatican because they could use it for the banking facilities, which are not strictly allowed in the Christian world, usury, interest, that sort of thing. So this is a Botticelli, and I think it could denote political freedom and republicanism. Um, another amazing one, which sadly is in Washington, not in London, and this boy is clearly uh, very um, erotically um, um, sort of inviting you, looking through his half-closed eyes, a very beautiful young aristocratic Florentine. Now, the head of Florence was, uh, was Lorenzo the Magnificent, painted by Agnolo Bronzino and characterized as shifty and rather snakish, but characterized entirely differently by Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo shows him as sensitive, uh, not broken, but very, very sensitive and very nervous. Anyway, here you can see the red again in full swing. Well, when we get to the French Revolution, first of all, the Phrygian cap,